Today's case is named as the rarest of the rare case to ever happen. The suspect would use a very odd choice of weapon for his evil deeds. And there's a lot to learn from today's case. The suspect almost went free, but with thorough investigations and testing, they were able to prove that the victim's death was not by accident, but indeed a murder. How they were able to prove this is something that we will dig in and is very interesting to go through the forensic evidence. I saw this case be covered in one of my favorite Korean true crime YouTuber, Kim Won. And interesting enough, this case, I haven't seen any English YouTubers cover this. So again, you're watching this first on my channel reporting this in English. Today's case is truly rare. And because of that, you guys know a lot of these true crime cases sometimes are demonetized. And I do work a long time translating, looking at all the sources. So your support in these videos by commenting, liking, subscribing really helps. Today's case happened in a region called Kerala in India. Also, it is in the state of India's tropical Malabar coast. So there's a lot of water, famous for boat rides, water activities, and things like that. And in this region, there was a couple named Suraj Kumar and Uthra. They got married in 2018, and Suraj at the time of the case was only 27 years old, and Uthra 25. They apparently met from a matchmaking service, and these are quite popular in Asia. I guess it's a thing in India as well. The time that I've heard about matchmaking is in East Asia. Asia, like in Korea and Japan and China. So matchmaking service is actually quite popular where they're able to background check and get your personality, what you're looking for, and match it with potentials who are all looking for a serious relationship at the end, marriage. At least in Korea, these are like fancy services and they cost a lot of money. I think for the man, it's actually like, 15 grand <laughs> like it's a crazy high service at least in south korea but they do take care of you and try to match you until you find someone that you are ready to marry i'm not sure if that's the same way that works in india in this case and if it was like half arranged marriage for kumar and uthra's case but regardless kumar did not come from a wealthy background at all he was a bank employee and his father was an auto rickshaw driver and his mother was a housewife so he himself didn't have much money as well and it said that because also maybe because kumar didn't grow up with money he always had this craving this like extreme greed when it came to finances now uthra the 25 year old young beautiful lady was actually disabled they say that she had a learning disability uthra's brother vishu says quote we wanted to find someone who would make her happy she was a girl who was a little different she had a learning disability we wanted a man who can take care of her they don't specify exactly what kind of learning disability but they do also say that it did affect her judgment ability as well she cannot see if someone is using her or not she only had kindness in her heart and only took orders so i guess she was very vulnerable in that sense and her family was really looking for a man that would take her now interesting in this case the female's family so uthra's family gave kumar's family a big dowry gift when they were getting married i believe it's pronounced dowry it's usually in the traditional cultures that still exist in asia today where Usually the male side of the family gives the female side of the family a big dowry, money, gift, jewelry, sometimes like in Thailand, especially in like the more traditional cultures, they even give you like cow or certain like farm animals as a sign of respect and exchange for your daughter's hand to be your wife. Now in South Korea, I believe traditionally, this is what my mom told me, the man side pays for the new house that you're gonna be living together. And the female family side helps pay a little bit for the wedding and household goods. Now in Kumar and Uthra's case, Kumar accepted the dowry from his wife's family, about 720 grams of gold, a Suzuki sedan car, and about 500,000 rupees, which equals to about $6.7,000 in cash. Now I'm assuming in this case, the female side gave dowry to the male because she had a disability. And a lot of people aren't willing to take care of someone that does have a disability. I guess in these kind of cases, there needs to be some kind of an exchange of monetary goods. So I'm assuming that is what happened here. I don't think even in India, it's usually the female side that gives dowry to the male, but I might be wrong. If you're Indian, leave a comment down below. 
below how that system works. A year into the marriage, they went on to have a son as well. From the outside, it seemed like the perfect arrangement. They found a man that was willing to take care of their disabled daughter. But inside of these families, something really dark and sinister was happening. Now, only a year into the marriage, Kumar thought that his wife was becoming inconvenient and he did not want to take care of his disabled wife any longer. And I guess to Kumar, he didn't see his wife as anything more than just a monetary financial gain. He saw her and her family, Uthra's family, as like a money sign. And it wasn't just Kumar, it was actually the entire family. Kumar's parents always demanded Uthra's parents to pay up. And in this report, they say that Uthra's family was demanded to pay up pretty much for all household items and furnitures and appliances, anything that they would need throughout the year or two, anything that they wanted. They just demanded the person, hey, like you should be buying this. Like your daughter's gonna be using it. Like your daughter's in their house you buy it. They demanded them to buy another car for them and even demanded that they pay for Kumar's sister's admission fees for her education. So they basically wanted Uthra's family to pay for not only Kumar, but Kumar's sister. And I'm guessing this is kind of how it went down. Kumar's family saw Uthra's disability as her weakness that they can leverage. And maybe said something like, hey, like we took in your disabled daughter that nobody wanted. And as a traditional, you know, marriage, she's not a virgin anymore she has a kid you know this is the only man that's gonna take care of her so you should be paying up more throughout the entire marriage and i'm sure uthra's family kind of felt in handcuffs like there was nothing else that they can really do but to accept the demands of the daughter's husband's family and it was later reported that kumar's parents also really treated her bad like physically bad when she was around the house i believe uthra was living with kumar and his parents house so can you get Guess how Kumar's parents probably even treated Uthra when she was around the house. I can't even imagine. Probably like made her feel like a, a Cinderella. Like made her do all the chores, do all the cooking and cleaning. Like more than what a normal traditional wife is supposed to do. It was reported that Uthra's father also agreed to pay Kumar's parents 8,000 rupees per month or $107 every single month and bought everything in order for Kumar's parents to treat Uthra nicely. Or at least as a family. But this was apparently not enough for Kumar and probably Kumar's parents. He said, quote, I grew dissatisfied with Uthra's learning disability. But before getting rid of her, he wanted to take everything from her. And this time, the last thing he would do was to try and get her life insurance. And it was in 2019, only a year again since their marriage, Kumar started to plot his own wife's murder. But obviously he doesn't want to go to jail for it or get caught. So he thought of a very sneaky way. And he came up with the plan of using a snake's venom as a weapon. Now, according to reports, snake bite death are not rare, especially in Kerala region of India. Well, I don't know if this is a report for entire India, but apparently there were 1.2 million fatalities from 2000 to 2019, which is a lot. And 99.9% .9 of these deaths are deemed as accidental. So no wonder like you would think that this is a perfect weapon so that no one finds you suspicious. Like 1.2 million fatalities from snake bite in India alone within the last 20 years is still a lot. So he started to get obsessed with this idea and started to watch a lot of videos, hours and hours of countless videos so that he can become a knowledge on how to handle a snake, the snake's venom, how it is penetrated into a human skin, and etc. And among the hours of videos that he watched, including snake masters videos, he found that there was a snake called Russell Viper, which is considered a very aggressive snake in Asia. There's a viral video out there with one drop of Russell Viper's venom turns like a blood into jelly. So it's supposed to quickly clog the human blood flow system. Hours of research, Kumar felt pretty much confident and ready to do this. So on February 26, 2020, Kumar would purchase the Russell Viper illegally from a snake handler. And from what I read, having snake pets in India, it is illegal if it is caught from the wild. I believe if it was like shipped from internationally, like those pet snakes, it's okay. And especially having a Russell's Viper 
over as a pet would be illegal. Now, the snake seller was named Chava Rukavu Suresh. Now, I did read somewhere that Suresh's wild caught snakes, this whole operation was illegal, cash business. Kumar would purchase the snake for about 10,000 rupees or about $135 and got to plan. His first plan was to do it right away. He put the snake on their stairs right between the first floor and second floor and told Uthra, who was upstairs, hey honey, can you get my phone downstairs? And hoping that she would go downstairs, just not notice a gigantic snake that is on your stairs. But of course, as Uthra went downstairs, she noticed the snake right in front of her, screamed and called for help from her husband. Her husband came down be like, oh, 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 there's a snake in the house, probably pretending like he knew nothing when he was the one who planted this, got a plastic bag and just swooped the snake and said he'll get rid of it. And now it was time for his second plan on March 2nd, only a few days later since his first try. This time he wanted her asleep. So he would get some sleeping pills, mix it in rice pudding and gave it to her. He saw her eat it and she quickly got really tired and fell into deep sleep. Again, which is sick because she is disabled. She probably doesn't have the capability to detect these things, uh, to find anything suspicious and sinister, and for him to watch her do this and use her vulnerability is crazy. Now, when she fell asleep, this is when Kumar brought out the snake again, and this time he wanted to make sure the snake bit her, and it did. Kumar made the snake bite into Uthra's arm, releasing poison. Now we will get into forensic evidence later of how they were able to prove that he manually forced the snake to release its venom versus being natural. You know, seeing a human and just biting into it. We will get to the forensics in a bit. It's very interesting how they were able to prove that it was manual. But Uthra says that she woke up in excruciating pain and she could not move. She asked her husband for help. And of course, the husband, Kumar, took his sweet time moving really slowly to try and get her to the hospital. Like, oh, okay, well, are you okay? Are you sure? Let me get a Band-Aid for you. Like, you sure you want to go to the hospital? Maybe you're okay. Maybe you're just sick. Apparently there were some delays, but she finally got to the hospital. Now, when they got to the hospital, Kumar told the doctors and Uthra's family, oh, I think she got bitten while she was, you know, manually washing the clothes in the bathroom. And this was a serious issue. I mean, Uthra was hospitalized for 52 days, so almost a month. But she got really lucky because she ended up recovering. Although she had to only lay in bed, she had skin grafted and was unable to walk properly again. So I'm guessing that she got skin grafted and she wasn't able to walk because it affected her nerves and probably her some of her blood was clogged. Kumar was really frustrated that his plans did not go through. And they found later in his phone records that the very next day after his wife was hospitalized, he searched on his phone, Cobra. Now he wanted a different snake a stronger snake. Now, Uthra, of course, at the hospital told her parents that, hey, I never washed clothes that night, so I'm not sure where I got bitten by a snake. Of course, having snake bites not be such a rare thing in India, they probably kind of looked over it. Finally, after a long recovery, Uthra would go back to her parents' house in order to recover some more. And on April 22nd, this is when she started to live at her parents' house. Kumar was in a hurry for whatever reason, and he went back to that snake dealer and purchased a cobra like right away. And on May 6th, just two weeks since Uthra was discharged from the hospital, somehow undetected, he would bring the cobra to Uthra's parents' house in, in another attempt to murder his wife. And same thing, Kumar would mix sleeping pills into some juice and gave it to his wife. And I guess like Uthra's parents weren't around when he was doing all of this or did it when they weren't looking. And of course, Uthra being such a nice lady, she probably just drank whatever the husband gave her and she trusted that man as her own family member, her husband. And this time, Uthra was sleeping in her bed again in her parents' house, and this was on the second floor. And this is where Kumar would bring out his jar where he pretty much kept the snake. And now Kumar would open up the jar where he put the cobra snake in and released it inside of the room in hopes that it would bite his wife. And this is a really, really sad and angering part 
for me, at least in my opinion, of course, aside from the victim, Uthra. We will get more into the forensic evidence and the autopsy, but they found that the snake was kept in the jar for over seven days. So for a number of days, it was just kept confined in the jar without any food. So he purposely starved the snake in hopes that it will be hungry enough to go and bite someone. Now it was the morning and Uthra woke up at the same time and came downstairs at the same time, but this time it seemed like Uthra was sleeping longer than usual. So her sister went upstairs to check up on her and she was found unconscious. They took her to the hospital right away. And unfortunately the next day, Uthra would pass away. They found that she had two snake bite marks on her arm. Now the parents were floored. They were like, she was just bitten by a snake like two months ago. You're telling me she was bitten by a snake again? I mean, this seemed like probability of like winning a lottery or like getting struck by a lightning. They knew that Uthra's room had AC, so the doors and the windows were all closed. They knew that the region they lived in, at least the part of the house where they, the town they were living in, it was a region where they didn't see any snakes around their house. They called a snake expert to their house to see where the snake could have possibly snuck up inside of their house and snake expert told Uthra's family you know this seems really odd this is impossible for a snake to even go up through their windows because their windows were higher than the amount that the snake could ever hold up their body this is when they started to have suspicions for Kumar when the police investigated this is what they stated along with the snake experts Number one, snakes do not bite unless purposely provoked. And they actually have to provoke the snake multiple times repeatedly to even try to bite a human being. They also stay dormant after 8 p.m. And there was an experiment done and there's a whole video about it done especially to prove for this case. So the investigators had a fake arm with a piece of meat in it and they were provoking the snake to see if it would bite it. And, and despite the multiple attempts, the snake wouldn't even bite the meat even after provoking. It. Now eventually it did try and fight back and did bite a little bit but again the snake had to be provoked repeatedly in order for it to do this. And experts did agree and the family also agreed that there was no way Uthra was awake and provoking the snake. The damning evidence was that during the autopsy they found two bite marks width of 2.3 and 2.8 centimeters so about 0.9 and 1.1 inches which was a much larger than cobra's fangs which are between 0.4 and 1.6 centimeters. And this was the nail into the coffin with the evidence because in order to get that distance of the cobra's fangs, it meant that someone had to push the cobra's upper jaws manually as if it was being milked. More experiments were done in this video if the cobra would bite a sleeping person. And in this experiment, the snake did not try to bite the human at all. Only when provoked repeatedly, they would cling on to the chicken breast. Experts also say that it was almost impossible for the snake to try and get inside of the house at least not through the windows or the AC vents or anywhere, snakes can only raise themselves vertically one third of their length. And their windows again were higher than the one third of the snake's length. Experts who have been bitten by the cobra snake or even a Russell Viper says that it is an excruciating pain, especially cobra's bite. Apparently what it does is that it affects the nerves and you're unable to move. So experts say that this is such an excruciating pain that Uthra probably woke up and she couldn't say anything or move because because it might have affected her nerves. Or maybe Kumar saw this being in the same room and he didn't do anything about it. He just watched his wife die. After all these evidence and almost having this case be concluded as a natural snake fatality, Kumar was arrested and the snake dealer was also arrested and Kumar's parents were also charged as well. They were charged with potentially helping Kumar get rid of any evidence. There were evidence of Kumar deleting his phone history with the snake dealer, washing the jars, so it definitely showed that he had a lot of guilt and something to hide. The police also decided to dig up the carcass of the snake because when they found the snake inside of Uthra's home when she passed away or the day that she was taken to the hospital, they actually ended up killing the snake. An interesting an autopsy or a post-mortem was done on the snake. And again, they found that the snake's abdomen was empty, meaning that it was true that the snake was kept confined for over seven days as snakes typically eat twice a day and take seven days to digest the food, meaning it was kept purposely starved. I think this is an evil, 
evil man. Now, Saroosh, the snake dealer, claims that he had no idea that the snake was being used for these purposes and that he had nothing to do with the murder. Apparently, when he found out about this whole case over the newspapers before he was arrested, he called up Kumara saying, WTF man, like, don't tell them that you bought the snake from me because now you're involving me in something that could potentially get me years in jail. Prior to their arrest, Kumar told Saroosh, we can pass her death off as a serpent curse and both avoid being implicated in murder. Now, apparently in Kerala, there's something called the Serpent Curse. It's a superstition belief that cobras have the power to curse families who don't worship them. The snake dealer, Saroosh, was later pardoned and decided to testify against Kumar. Kumar was later sentenced to two life sentences on October 13th, 2021. The court also said that this was their first known case where someone was sentenced to use a snake as a murder weapon. So what was the main motive though? And police found that the main motive probably was again, life insurance and to take more possession of his wife's precious jewelry and gold. They found that a few months before Uthra's death, Kumar had applied for life insurance under Uthra, indicating that he wanted some kind of a paycheck for her death. And again, this case is called the rarest of the rare case. And who knows now, the 99.9% .9 of the cases that are deemed as accidental, maybe some of them, one or two more of them could have been intentional. Uthra's family says that now they have their grandson and quote, we will make sure he knows who his mother was. Clearly this man Kumar was heartless. He didn't want to get a divorce, instead decided to get a paycheck out of his wife's death taking advantage to this point of, of someone's vulnerability and disability, I think is evil and sinister to the core. I hope that you guys have learned a lot from today's case. Let me know what you guys have thought on the comments down below. Remember, if you have any case suggestions, you can email me at askcrazy at gmail.com. Like this video, which all helps to spread the messages. What if you weren't allowed to have boyfriends, have sleepovers, see friends, you had to wear a certain type of clothes, had to come back home immediately, have a strict curfew, not even allowed to use your house phone, all without your parents' consent. Today we're going to be talking about the Shafia family, known as one of the most strictest, darkest family that Canada has ever seen. This is the Shafia family from Afghanistan. They were a big family and the head of the household was father named Muhammad Shafia. This is his wife Tuba and together they had seven children. Muhammad Shafia was known to be a very successful businessman. He started out from Afghanistan and then moved to Dubai where he worked at a, some kind of successful used car business and he also branched out to the real estate business. From there, I believe they moved to Australia and some other places, eventually landing themselves in Quebec. Canada for a business opportunity. He ended up investing two million dollars to a mall and he was also building a huge house for their family to end up settling and living a great life in Canada. Shortly after they settled, Shafia sent a request to the immigration office saying that he wanted to sponsor his cousin to come to Quebec in order to work as their housekeeper slash nanny. Now his cousin was named Rana, but come to find out Rana was not his cousin, she was actually his first first wife. So he was actually into a polygamous marriage, but that's not allowed in Canada. Therefore, he had to obviously pretend that like Rana was his cousin in order to bring her over. They got married in the late 1980s and found out that Rana could not have children. So Shafia had a second marriage in 1989 to Tuba, where they ended up having seven kids. Their eldest daughter was Zainab, she was 19. Sahar, 17. Hamed, their firstborn son. Daughter A, who was never identified. Younger brother B, another daughter C, who she was never identified. And their youngest daughter, Getty, who was 13 years old. The marriage between Shafia and Rana was very rocky and she records it in her diary very detailed throughout the many years. In the diary, she wrote about her hell marriage that she had to deal with, especially after finding out that she couldn't have children. He would taunt her, hit her, and blame her for everything. She wanted to leave, and I don't know what the culture is really like for them, but she says that she cannot leave because he always threatened that he would kill her if she left the marriage. Not only her husband, but their second wife, Tuba, 
also was like the priority wife or the preferred wife as they call it and she also made it a living hell for Rana. Rana says that Tiva was trying to separate and farther her away from their shared husband and Rana just became like a nanny to the family and she was called auntie to the kids. Tiva was allowed to buy expensive jewelries, learn to drive and again she was the preferred wife and Rana was someone that she had no freedom. Like she couldn't even use the house phone. And only received $50 in allowance every month. I mean, can you imagine you're a wife of a multi-millionaire and you only get $50 of allowance and can't even use the house phone? She was also not allowed to have any hobbies. Tuba would tell Rana, your life is in my hands. You are my servant in her diaries. After moving to Canada, a Western country, of course, the family thought that they were now, you know, a bit more free to do things. After all, this was Canada. It's really free in Canada. I've been there. But even if they were living in Canada, inside of the Shafia home was very much under the strict rule of their father, Shafia. No meeting the opposite sex, no wearing certain clothes, must wear a hijab for some of the girls, no makeup, certain attitude, no sleepovers, no going over to friend's house, and so many other rules. And it seems like this rule didn't really apply to the males, but only the females. But to be fair, it seems like I read somewhere that Shafia did provide the family with a lot of money Money to, to eat whatever they wanted. So they never went hungry or anything like that. And he also bought them expensive clothes. Keep in mind to him, honor. He, he continuously says honor about the family. Honor and the family was so important to him. I mean, whatever honor was to him. The children attended regular public school and they were very accustomed to their Canadian Western lifestyle. Now, one day, eldest daughter Zainab, who was 19 years old, she's pretty much an adult, she met a boy and they fell in love. But again, unlike other families, she was not allowed to have any boyfriends. She was not allowed to date and the only person that she can meet was a man that their father approved. So she had to meet her boyfriend in hiding, such as in the school library or a secret location, in fear that her boy brothers would find out and tattletale to their father, which would be a huge deal. She would tell her boyfriend to act like they're strangers if they were around their brother and to not give a slightest clue that they're even friends. Come to find out the man in the family, especially their brother Hamed, was like a mandatory reporter and like the second dad. Even though Zainab was the older eldest daughter, brother, the younger brother, had more power than she could ever imagine. If he has ever seen their sisters do anything against the family rule, he would report it and they would get severe punishment. According to them, severe punishment meaning beatings, verbal abuse, and even lots of threats to kill them. It's hard to imagine because it's like what kind of parents would actually really threaten you to kill them for meeting boyfriends or coming home late? You know, doing teenager stuff. I mean, it's something that most teenagers, actually all teenagers do. It's a time in your life where you want to explore and have freedom and meet people it's just it's just natural human instinct but Zainab would tell her boyfriend all the time you don't know my father he is that kind of a person. Shafia, the father, he had a lot of business in Dubai, so he actually went back and forth very often. One time when he went back to Dubai, she snuck her boyfriend into the house, which is one of the biggest no-nos that they could ever imagine. She did not know that her brother Hamed would be coming home so early, and unfortunately, they were caught. This is the crazy part, but Hamed, being the firstborn son in the house, had immense power. He told, his older sister that she could not go back to school. So she ended up being confined to her room and not going to school for over a year. I what? Not only that, but if she wanted to leave the house, she needed a relative chaperone. Like, she couldn't leave the house alone. Talking about some of the other sisters, Sahar, who was 17 years old, also lived under intense stress. Obviously, really wanted to wear makeup and take off her hijab at school. So whenever she was dropped off, she would go into the school, take off her hijab, put on some makeup, and just kind of act like a normal Western kid. She was accused of kissing a boy and dating, and told the teachers about 
about how she was so depressed and did not like how the family was treating her. And so she was talking to school counselors or whoever about her situations, but it seemed like it wasn't as serious as most Western teachers would know because they don't know the other cultures that were what kind of lifestyle or what kind of honor family that they were truly living in. She was so unhappy with her family and the strict rules that she attempted self-harm by poisoning herself. Unfortunately, her mother, Tuba, only replied, she can go kill herself. You can go to hell. Her own parents didn't even come to comfort her. After this incident, obviously the school officials called the parents to let them know like what is going on into your family, let's talk about it. But the parents got super angry and was saying that Shahar was lying and that she was a bad teenager and that you know it was all made up and whatever happened between Sahar and the parents she ended up coming back to school and saying that she was okay and she just wanted to go back home she didn't want to make a big deal about it so that case was closed but on the side Sahar was calling her relatives back in Afghanistan saying that she really wanted to get out of the family or run away or do something. Their youngest daughter, Getty, who was only 13 years old, was also rebelling against the family. I mean, of course, she's 13, she has her own hobbies, interests, want to meet friends, but instead she was going through an extreme depression, missing schools, bad grades, and she was even caught shoplifting. She claims that she wasn't only punished by her parents, but her brother, Hamed, for just coming home a little late from the mall, and she was beaten by her brother. So so it's been about a year now since Zainab has been punished from going to school, but she couldn't take it anymore. So she somehow contacted her boyfriend through her sister and they were able to seek Lee chat, I believe using emails. So she one day snuck out of her home and explained what was exactly going on in her family to her boyfriend. She told him that she wanted to run away and rather you're gonna help me or not, I'm running away tomorrow. And the very next day, her boyfriend picked her up and she was declared missing. Zainab decided to seek help from a woman's shelter. And once Hamed, her brother, found out that she was missing or ran away, he called the police and filed a missing persons report. The day that their eldest sister was missing was also the day that the whole kids knew that they were also going to be in trouble. The rest of the kids didn't even go back home that day because they were afraid they were going to be punished by their own parents. Police came and were talking to the kids and the kids actually confessed what was going on inside their house. And the kids told the police about their abuse, being kicked in the face, punched in the eye, the threats, and so much more. So of course, their parents were called to this incident and it seems like as soon as their parents were called, the kids just got so afraid that they just started to kind of downplay things. And the police just let them go back to their house and nothing much really happened after that. So this is where the things get super shaky and scary. It's been about one month since Zainab has left the house and Rana overheard a conversation between Hamed, Tuba, and Safar. They were discussing about how they wanted to kill their daughter Zainab and the other ones. Now Rana assumed that this was her that she was also the next target. Eventually, somehow, Zainab and Tuba, her mother, got in touch with each other and they had a plan. And police believe the murder plan started from here. So to Zainab's surprise, Tuba, the mother, said she will allow her and her boyfriend to get married as long as she returns home. Zainab obviously thought that this was not like her parents, but who knows, maybe her running away was something that their parents needed a wake-up call and finally allowed her to be free and become an adult. So she ended up coming back home and even though her parents did not want her to get married, she stuck with it and they decided to have a marriage ceremony. Two weeks later, after Zainab returned home, it was finally wedding day. It was reported that actually in this small wedding reception, even her boyfriend's family didn't come because they also didn't approve of the marriage. But according to the relatives, not even having the boyfriend's family come to the reception really embarrassed Tuba, I guess. Not even having like the boyfriend's family come was like a disaster and a failed marriage to her. She was so upset that she fainted during the ceremony. This is when Zainab just couldn't take it anymore. She had a small talk with her mother and that day at the ceremony, she told her husband that they had to get a divorce and that the marriage was over and it wasn't even a couple hours. I'm sorry, 
I have to stick with my family. The father was so angry, but he was in Dubai. And he told his relatives that if he was there, he would have killed her right then and there. And that he needs to restore the family honor by marrying someone else that he approved. Who was Tuba's uncle's son? Is that like second cousin, third cousin? I don't know. During this whole time before their father arrived, Sahar was also caught at a restaurant seeing her boyfriend as well. Now she was caught by her younger brother, B. And B told their parents, you know, I saw Sahar with a boy and I think she's dating someone. And the truth was, yes, Sahar was seeing her Latino boyfriend and they were very much in love. Sahar even faced did in school and people were getting very worried because she was not eating. She lost so much weight that again, she fainted in school. When the nurses called their parents to pick her up from school, nobody came. And Sahar ended up just walking back home herself. So it was these three girls that was causing me trouble in the eyes of their family. Now it was finally time for their father Safira to come back home from Dubai. To their surprise, when their father arrived back in America, they all claimed that their father father's attitude changed and that he was much less strict and he was very lenient. But of course, it was a little bit fishy. Did the father really forgive their daughters or was it all part of a plan. Now shortly after their father arrived, it was June 22nd when the father purchased a used car, a 2004 Nissan Sinantra, and told the family that they're all going on a nice summer vacation. So the next day, they all hit the road and ate some good food, went to see some waterfalls, see some people, and you can see in these photos, they are having a wonderful time. During this time, and even couple weeks before this, police actually found evidence evidence of Hamed using his laptop and his phone to search for Can a prisoner have control over their real estate? Canada mountains with lake in Quebec Documentary on murders and where to commit a murder At one point when the family was sleeping at a motel It was recorded on his phone that Hamed drove all the way 5 hours to check out crime scenes To see where it would be of the perfect spot On June 29th at 8pm, the family checked out of the motel and headed for another road trip Investigators believe that they hit the road late at night starting from 8pm to over midnight On purpose so that the girls would be tired. Now here is when the things get a little mysterious and it's pretty much kind of a guess of what investigators think happened. So there were two cars, a Lexus owned by the family and the Nissan, the used car. In the Nissan, Rana, Zainab, Sahar, and Getty were riding and the driver who was switching between Tuba, Jafira, and Hamed and their Lexus with their other children. The next day, the police found the Nissan car underneath the water and all four members of the family, Rana, Zainab, Sahar, and Getty passed away. Even till this day, we don't know how, but Rana and the three girls were led to a secluded location in a canal, and police believe that they were held underwater by someone or some people. Were they held underwater all at the same time, one by one? We don't know. The mysterious thing about this is that there were really no signs of struggle. The only thing they found were some bruises on top of their heads that suggest that they were struck with something, but it was only found in three of the girls' heads. So they could have been struck by something, then drowned, then put back into the car. That's when the family somehow pushed the car into the canal. There are certain possibilities of how this happened, and they believe that all three members, Tuba, Sophia, and Hamid, were at the scene, and one of them might have been taking turns, or one of them leading the whole thing to self-lead the car inside the water. But when that wasn't working, they believe the Lexus was used to push the Nissan car into the canal. And they found evidence of the Lexus car's headlights, pieces that broke off, that were still stuck or inside the Nissan car. The next day, there was a record of Hamed even calling his sister's phone to make it seem like he was looking for them when he knew that they were gone. Around noon, the three members of the family, the parents and Hamed, walked into the police station seeking for help of finding their missing children and Rana. Immediately, the police knew something was up, that the story did not make sense. First of all, the family did not seem like they were in a panic. 
they seemed okay. And when three of them were interviewed separately, they still remained their innocence, that they had nothing to do with it, and they did not know what was going on. They all give a story that it seems like Zainab was a troubled teenager and that she took the car and wanted to go for some joy ride during the middle of the night and somehow she ended up inside the water due to an accident because she couldn't drive. There was actually a witness in the scene and it was an eight-year-old boy saying that he saw two cars in the scene that day. So the police knew there was some other car that could have been involved. The autopsy showed that there were no drugs found in the system of any one of the girls. And again, just three of the people had bruising on top of their head. The final conclusion of their death was drowning. I mean, if you think about it, it's four people. And they were all grown up, minus Getty, who was 13, but still. Like, how did they not overpower the people who were doing this to them? Like, who did the actions? Were all three doing the actions? Like, no one really knows, but to overpower four people, that's 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 a lot. So if you guys have any guess of what you think happened and how they were able to get four of the girls to drown, let me know in the comments because I can't even figure that out. There was a lot of media trying to interview the family after that day, and they were seen being very very tearful and at loss of their own children. But of course, behind the scenes, police knew that this family was very suspicious. So with enough evidence, they were able to get a wiretapping warrant granted by the judge. And what police heard throughout the couple days was shocking. All three of them just bashing and cursing at their deceased family members. To hell with their boyfriends, filthy rotten children, whores. And talking about how they believe the police might be onto them that they all have to stick to the same story and just a lot and that was enough evidence for them to get a warrant to finally arrest the Safiya families. When the Shafia family was arrested, they kept their innocence. Somewhere throughout, they, I believe, changed the story to Hamed being the one who done the deeds to actually pushing the car into the water. They came up with the story saying that he was young, he was just playing around, accidentally pushed the car into the water, and he didn't report it because he was scared. Of course, prosecutors were firm that they premeditated everything from the Google searches, from all the reports from 911 from past. They believe that this was something called honor killing. One of the prosecutors stated, what masquerades as honor is really a man's need to control a woman's sexuality. If a man cannot control his own household, which is represented by the behaviors of the female members, it means he cannot be trusted for any other public matters. Their youngest son, B, testified in court saying that their family was great and that his sisters were the rebellious ones being bad teenagers and that it was him who actually searched where to murder because he was suicidal he didn't know the difference between suicide and murder and that's why he searched murder eventually the judge did not buy their stories and they were all sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years this is such truly a sad case the girls only wanted freedom. Rana also wanted freedom. They were tricked into having a wonderful vacation by their own parents and their own brother. And the fact that there were so many chances of getting help from yet no help was given is just crazy to me. Let me know what you guys have thought. Thank you so much for watching. Remember, your help goes a long way just by hitting the like button, sharing, and subscribing so that we can share these messages and, and what kind of things that go on so we can learn from them. Thank you so much for watching and see you in my next video. I need everybody to help share this video today. Comment, like this video, share this with your friends because still to this day the victim has never gotten justice. Everybody knows who could be the main suspect but this person was never brought to trial because of loopholes in the law. I'm so surprised that there's no other YouTubers that I could find who talked about this case. Only a famous documentary 48 hours that covered it. I look a little bit experimental today. I tried to do some blue makeup and go along with this funky blue top. It's super cute. And if you guys 
follow me on TikTok and Instagram, you guys know I always bring the trendy outfits to you guys. We're going to be talking about victim Carolyn today. She was an English teacher in South Korea and she was brutally murdered. So Miss Carolyn was teaching English in Nepal, Japan before she came to Korea. People describe her as being a very cheerful, funny, adventurous, and she loved to explore. While she was teaching English in Japan, she even met a man named Tomoyuki. The two fell in love and he even proposed to her and they were supposed to get married. Just before their love grew into something even bigger, she took a job in South Korea teaching English again. She joined a group of English teachers in South Korea and they said that she immediately became friends with everyone and that's just how she was. Funny, bubbly, and just a big personality. I remember when I was young and very young when I was in Korea, like six, seven, eight years old, um, I went to English Hagwon Academies. So I remember when I went to academies and when I would see a foreigner, non-Asian, I would get super excited and nervous because it's like, you're first time in your life ever seeing someone that's very different than you. And there's a lot of people who want to work in South Korea just because it's so fun there and adventurous. Among many other English teacher that was there, Carolyn met a woman named Kathy, who was pretty much the leader of the whole English Academy group. The co-workers described Carolyn and Kathy being like BFFs and besties. And they were always sticking together, just like you would have with your own girlfriends. After work and on the weekends, they would go to Itaewon and just party and they felt a little bit home like they were in America. One of the last days Carolyn was seen alive was December 17th, 1988. Carolyn, Kathy, some of the other teachers, and some Korean students went to the mountains to take pictures and explore. And here's some of the last photos of Carolyn and the students. Tomoyuki, who was a fiance of Carolyn, even was planning a trip to South Korea so that they could plan and eventually get married. It was on December 20th, the working day, and Carolyn was nowhere seen at work at the academy. No one was really freaking out. Some co-workers said that it was totally possible for people to miss work. But one person was very frantic that Carolyn was not at work and that was the leader, Kathy. Co-workers say Kathy was very frantic, very nervous and asking around if anyone has seen Carolyn. She wasn't picking up her phone and Kathy was convinced something could have happened to Carolyn. So some of the co-workers decided to go check up and Carolyn and just see if she was at her home. A group of Korean students took the English teachers to Carolyn's apartment and the door was unlocked, they say. It was then when Kathy decided to go inside Carolyn's room and that was when she was the first person to discover Carolyn brutally murdered in her own room. They soon called an ambulance and this became one of the biggest stories in South Korea, a brutal murder of a foreigner. There was evidence of her fighting back, including hand marks, her throat was cut from ear to ear, and she was stabbed 30 times and there was blood just everywhere. All the coworkers, the English coworkers, were really frightened thinking that it was probably another Korean who killed this foreign woman just because maybe out of hate crime. Everybody thought it was like a drunk Korean old age man who just came in, took the opportunity, and just unfortunate thing happened. A lot of people say if you're in a foreign country, you could be an easy target because it's harder for you to call anyone for help. Maybe you don't know where to call for help. And the English teachers were actually all afraid that this could happen to them. A couple days later, they had this memorial ceremony for Carolyn inside this English academy, and Kathy was the one who led this memorial because she was her BFF. Kathy being the best friend of Carolyn, she even wrote a letter to Carolyn's family, trying to comfort them and saying, let me know if you want to know anything because she was her best friend. And she also wrote that she wanted to one day meet them. Carolyn's family was devastated, especially they were in America and to have their daughter be brutally murdered in another country, that must be just absolutely, absolutely frustrating. Tomoyuki eventually still flew to South Korea and he was there at the memorial and he stayed with Kathy and the roommate Sandra. This was a huge case and I don't know why people do this, but you know, these English coworkers even got prank calls from people saying that they know who the killer is. But later they found out that this was a prank call, you know, people just wanting to be evil. And so this random woman called the coworkers saying that her ex-boyfriend was the murderer because she wanted to get back at him. I mean, there's just crazy people out there that prank call. So this person turned out not to be the murderer and the police 
police was trying to find out who could have done this to Carolyn. Now, based on the forensic evidences and how she died, forensic professionals believe that this had to be someone that Carolyn was very close to. Police usually say that random acts of murder are usually not brutal. Usually, if it's accidental or someone that they didn't know, they won't go as far as you know slitting the throat or going very brutal. And number two, there was no forced entry. No, no evidence that the door was broken or the windows. And number three, there was two coffee cups inside Carolyn's room where she passed away. This led forensic investigators to believe that someone very comfortable was in Carolyn's room, them two just drinking coffee when this happened. Now, while this investigation was going on, co-workers say that Kathy looked so depressed, like she lost about 15 pounds. I mean, everybody was at the shock at the moment and especially Kathy being the best friend, she just took it the hardest. She wanted to go back to the US to kind of distance herself from this horrific thing that has happened and her co-workers even encouraged her because she was just looking so distraught and they could not focus on their job. Reviewing the forensic evidence, police grew suspicions and wanted to interview people that was the most closest to Carolyn while she was working in South Korea. And the closest people was Kathy and Sandra. Sandra was Kathy's roommate. Now, right around this time, Kathy actually left back to the US and the police were only able to interview Sandra. Investigators started questioning Sandra and asked her if she had anything to do with Carolyn's murder. The investigator said that she paused for 30 seconds and then just said no, which is really odd. Like, why would you have to pause to say that? Sandra eventually had to take a lie detector test and when asked if she knew the murder weapon or where this murder weapon was, she replied no and she failed the lie detector test. This is when Sandra started confessing to everything that she knew about Carolyn's murder. Now, shockingly, Sandra started to confess something that no one believed would ever happen. She claimed that one night, Kathy came home telling her that she killed Carolyn. Sandra claimed that she was in disbelief that this has ever happened and that they both decided to go to Carolyn's apartment, where indeed Sandra saw the body of Carolyn. This is when Kathy told Sandra to help her to make it look like it was an intruder and that it was accidental. And for some reason, Sandra says that Kathy manipulated her. Let me know what you guys think of this manipulation, but that she manipulated her to help her to make it look like it was an accident or that it was a robbery gone wrong. So they threw Carolyn's stuff all around the floor, threw away the murder weapon, and next what happened is crazy. Now for some odd reason, at first Sandra confessed to the police that it was her who cut the throat of Carolyn just in case that she was alive and that they both get in trouble. Sandra also said that she cleaned up the knife that Kathy used to first murder Carolyn. Now later on, Sandra retracted these statements saying that these were just memories implanted into her brain um, during the police interrogation. I think this means that the police was really grinding down on her and being under intense pressure and interrogation and she just confessed to something that she didn't do. That's what she's possibly claiming. So who knows if she actually did this or not or who's telling the truth. Eventually, Sandra pled guilty and was charged for her heart a criminal and suppressing evidence and she was only sentenced to one year in Korean jail. For some reason, Sandra was released early from jail. So she technically only served six months, but she did agree to try to help the FBI in order to get a confession from Kathy. Now remember this happened back in 1988, so I don't believe there was even DNA evidence that was collected. So the only thing that police could go by is a confession. So the main question is, what was the motive? Why did Kathy have to eliminate her best friend? Her bestie, according to everybody. I mean, they were having an awesome time in Korea, teaching English in a foreign country, having fun in Itaewon. What went wrong here? Now, according to these two workers, they were the only very few people that knew that Kathy was actually lesbian. Kathy would always talk about Carolyn and she even confessed to them that she was in love with Carolyn. Kathy apparently 
family felt for Carolyn very hard and she was almost obsessive telling Tamara that she thinks that Carolyn likes her and that she wants to make a move on her. They knew that Carolyn wasn't gay and that she wouldn't be interested in dating Kathy. According to these co-workers, it seemed like Kathy was just so in love with Carolyn and could not stop even talking about her. Now, so this is what the investigators believe actually happened to Carolyn on the night of December 1988. This is just a possible scenario just to let you guys know, but they believe that Kathy and Carolyn were talking inside Carolyn's room that night and Kathy started to confess to Carolyn that she wanted to advance their relationship and wanted more than friends. Police say that they believe Kathy leaned in for a kiss to Carolyn and this is when Carolyn rejected and Kathy all of a sudden snaps and she decided to just get rid of Carolyn. She could not control her emotions and feelings and for some reason decided to end her life. I can't even imagine the shock that Carolyn would have at that moment seeing your best friend in a foreign country trying to attack you because you did not want to advance their relationship. If this story is true, it's just mind-boggling how someone just because they rejected you that you would lash out like that. Police were now firm that it was Kathy who has murdered Carolyn and the Korean police requested Kathy to be extradited back to South Korea for questioning and trial but because in 1980s during this time there was no extradition treaty between US and South Korea and therefore she couldn't be forced to be extradited back to South Korea and obviously she's not going to be willingly come to the US according to what has happened. When Carolyn's family went to the police, they told them that they could not arrest her because she didn't commit the crime on U.S. soil. Again, back then, there was no law saying that a U.S. citizen who killed another U.S. citizen in a foreign country could be trialed in U.S. There was no law, apparently, back then. I don't know why, but... Family of Carolyn were devastated and the father was trying to do everything that he can to get some kind of media attention so that the police would care enough Enough to try and get Kathy. Due to the family's hard work, they were eventually able to get the police to interrogate Kathy. Now when she was questioned, Kathy claimed that she did not murder Carolyn and that her roommate Sandra's confessions were all lies and that she was never in love with Carolyn. But she took a lie detector test and she was found to be deceptive, meaning she failed the lie detector test. Now this is not enough evidence to convict anyone, so the FBI got the help of Sandra and she decided to try and get a confession out of Kathy. So Sandra claimed that she had a recorder set by the FBI in her clothing. She went to Kathy's house and the first thing Sandra asked was, how could you have killed Carolyn? Kathy just dismissed her and said, I don't know what you're talking about and just closed the doors. It's been 30 years and no suspect, nobody was brought to justice in connection to Carolyn's death. Carolyn's family had no choice and they were devastated, but they did fight for their daughter and eventually in 1994 there was a law passed where US citizens can be prosecuted if they commit a crime in another country. And yes, finally now there is an extradition treaty between US and South Korea. Now a lot of you guys might be asking, well can they extradite Kathy now? Now unfortunately in Korea regarding Carolyn's case, the statute of limitation has expired. And apparently according to Carolyn's family, the South Korean police told them that all the evidence was destroyed. What? I don't know how that's possible. I thought they were supposed to keep all the files just in case that a case gets revealed later on. If you guys work in the police enforcement, let me know if this happens where they just like shred the papers and get rid of evidences if it's been too long. But anyway, due to all these circumstances, it is highly unlikely professionals say that Kathy will ever be extradited back to South Korea. What is Miss Kathy doing now? She apparently has been living a quiet life in Washington. At first, Kathy declined an interview with 48 Hours, claiming that this was a painful memory and that she did not want it to be brought back. So, like Savage, 48 Hours decided to go to the school that she was working in, and she apparently is a counselor in Western Washington University. So she's been working here for about 20 years, living just a quiet, comfortable life. So basically, the documentary crew barges into the school. Kathy has no idea that these people 
people are coming to interview her. The host tells her that the investigators strongly believe that she murdered Carolyn. And that's when Kathy gets very nervous and says, um, I have to say I'm innocent and I don't know what happened. And that she failed the polygraph test back then because she was traumatized about the situation. She then went to say that possibly Sandra was the one who murdered Carolyn. You can see her licking her lips kind of really extremely nervous. Now this could be because you have like a news crew with cameras and people just barging in all of a sudden asking you about a murder that happened 30 years ago. And yes, you could be nervous, but if you guys are one of those behavior professionals, let me know what you guys think about this interview. This is a statement from Washington University. They stated that they had no problems with Kathy for the last 20 years that she has worked with the university. So the question that I have is, who do you think did it? Who murdered Carolyn? And the question that the documentary also had was, if Kathy was the suspect, do you think she could lash out again? I mean, she is quite older now, but do you think it's possible she could commit another crime? Still to this day, Carolyn's family is searching for answers and trying to find any ways that they can do to bring these people into justice. Like I said, there was no other YouTubers who have covered this story, at least that I could find. But if we get enough awareness, we can help solve these cases, you guys. And if you guys are early to my videos, I always reply to my early birds. Have a magical day, you guys. What if you went to a foreign country thinking you would have the best time of your life? A country known to be safe, full of fun things to do, but end up never coming back home. This killer was so desperate that he decided to deform and give himself plastic surgery in order to evade the police. Tatsuya Ichihashi is one of the most infamous criminals in Japan. The story was so crazy it was made into movie and even a book. Tatsuya was born on January 1979. When this story happened, he was just 28 years old. He grew up in the Gifu area of Japan and he was the son of a mother who was a dentist and a father who was a doctor. So safe to say he grew up pretty well. It's not like he grew up poor or lacking anything. He also got a very good education where he graduated at Chiba University in 2005 majoring in horticulture. But despite his doctor parents and graduating at a university, Tatsuya was known to be a very big loner. A lot of people online believe that he could have been a hikikomori, where these are the type of people who feel very isolated from the public and society, and they seek extreme degrees of social isolation and confinement. Not only was he known to be a loner, but he was known to be a very lazy guy. After he graduated, he didn't get a job, and he lived off of his parents' allowance. His parents gave him a monthly allowance of about seven $160 and this was back in 2005 and due to his parents he was also able to afford a three-bedroom apartment in Japan and if you guys don't know or haven't been in Japan Japanese apartments are super small and it is actually very lucky if you even get a two-bedroom apartment so the fact that he had three bedroom apartment it meant that he was living very comfortable as a jobless man in his 20s he sometimes even stole to get by and right after graduation he tried to steal from a woman where he ended up assaulting her but that case went into mediation I believe so it was settled outside of court and it's speculated that his father paid the woman off about $10,000 so that case was gone and he never got into any official punishment or trouble. So it seems like anytime he got into trouble, his parents were able to bail him out. According to people who knew him, including his then girlfriend, they said that he was obsessed with his body. He went to the gym, often cycled 25 kilometers a day, which is about 15 miles. He also really liked to read violent manga. I mean, that's what usually comic books are for, for your fantasies to come alive that you can't in reality. It was reported that he did have a stable relationship with the girl he was dating at the time and the woman was working at Tokyo Disney and it was said that he really liked her. It was starting 2007 when Tatsuya claimed that he was becoming mentally unstable, whatever that means. On March 20th, 2007, he approached a foreign woman named Lindsay Hawker. Lindsay was a 22 year old who worked as an English teacher in Japan. She was from England and she studied biology where she graduated at the University of Leeds. She was very smart, even achieved first class honors degree. She was someone who was so bright, intelligent, and wanted to branch out, which is the reason why she wanted to go to Japan and kind of explore more and have a new experience in life. She started teaching English in Japan in 2006 under the Nova Company, which was a huge English school service that connects teachers to students. She lived in Japan with two other roommates who were also English teachers. 
So back to March 20th, 2007, Lindsay was on the train back home from her work and this is where Tatsuya approached her. When she got off the train, Tatsuya also got off the train and started to ask her some odd questions. Tatsuya started saying, hey, I know you, you're my English teacher. Lindsay said, I'm sorry, I don't recognize you. I don't know you, you're not my student. She knew this was super awkward, so she got on her bike and started cycling back to her apartment. Tatsuya literally ran and followed her all the way to her apartment which could be very dangerous because now the stranger knows where you live now when they got to the apartment tatsuya he asked for a glass of water and lindsay kind of felt bad at this point and she knew that she had two roommates up in the apartment so that this random guy couldn't do anything and if he did the roommates would come and try to help her and because you're a foreigner in a country i guess you try to be more nice and give more of the benefit of the doubt because you might not understand that person or that culture personality. They went inside, she gave him a glass of water and Tatsuya started to draw Lindsay. I think this was his awkward way of trying to get to know her or trying to get comfortable with her. And here's a drawing that Tatsuya drew of Lindsay and he wrote his email, his phone number, and his name. And if you see his email, his email was whitelover at hotmail.com. Yeah. At the end, before he left, he kept insisting that he wanted her to become his English teacher and that he would pay a great money, around $30, I believe, an hour. So that wasn't bad. So, I mean, I'm sure anyone could use an extra cash and she could meet potentially a new friend in Japan. So she agreed. Lindsay was also known to keep in contact with her family and friends very well. She actually emailed her boyfriend in England saying that she met a man in Japan and that she wanted to teach English. Four days later, on March 24th, that's when they met up at a coffee shop to have this private tutoring. CCTV footage shows them in the coffee shop and in my opinion, she is very uncomfortable. You could see her touching her hair. You could see like her kind of taking a step back whenever he's kind of like going like this to her. And especially when women are touching their hair like this, it's definitely a sign that she is very uncomfortable here. But you know, she's here to teach English and be very professional. After the one hour lesson was over, Tatsuya suddenly claimed that he forgot his money to pay her for the lesson. So Tatsuya said, hey, why don't you come over to my apartment? I'll give you the money. My apartment is just right over here. We just need to take a quick taxi and that's it i will pay you we don't know if Lindsay hesitated or how agreeable she was to this but in the end she did agree to take the taxi to tatsuya's home when they got to tatsuya's apartment Lindsay told the taxi driver to wait for her because she was going to be out in a minute in about seven minutes passed before the taxi driver decided to leave and just take on other customers the taxi driver believed that she just wasn't coming back anymore this was the last time anyone have seen Lindsay alive ever again. She didn't show up to her other lessons, didn't answer her calls and emails, and the Nova school eventually reported her missing two days after. When the police was investigating Lindsay's disappearance, the roommates told her that she didn't come back the day that she was supposed to give a man named Tatsuya the English lessons. The roommates gave the police the drawing that Tatsuya made, and this is when police decided to go to Tatsuya's apartment to see if he knew anything about Lindsay. Police actually couldn't even knock on the door of Tatsuya's apartment because they didn't have legal reasons and unless you do I guess you can't even knock on the door so so the police was kind of standing around his apartment to see if he would come in and out to try and interview him now I'm not sure coincidentally where Tatsuya saw that there was police standing outside of his apartment he decided to leave his apartment barefoot with just a backpack he was confronted by the police and he got super nervous and he just started running eventually Tatsuya was able to outrun the police and starting here would be a very very long manhunt chase for Tatsuya Ichihashi. Police found Lindsay inside Tatsuya's apartment and what happened to her was just brutal. Lindsay was found inside of a bathtub that was moved from the bathroom to the balcony. I guess they have removable bathtubs? He had filled the tub with sand and compost soil. She was found clothingless, bounded, and gagged. Autopsy showed that she tried to fight off the attack. Her final death was most likely by a neck cartilage breaking. And police believe he was waiting for the body to decompose inside the mixture. This was when there was a huge warrant and a manhunt for Tatsuya and his picture was everywhere. 
There was even a big cardboard cutout of Tatsuya just in case anyone have seen him. Police even photoshopped a picture of potentially when Tatsuya would disguise as a woman. During his run, Tatsuya actually wrote in a diary about his emotions and how he got by while he was on the run. He says that he got around different areas of Japan by train, ferry, and walking. He even traveled to very rural areas, even going to the Buddhist temple in the mountains, where in one of the pages he wrote that he wishes Lindsay would come back to life. He even spent time in a tiny island of Oha where only four families lived. Lived in a concrete bunker, ate wild food, fish that he caught, and he even ate snakes when he got really hungry. He claims that this was such a hard life for him, you know, just being on the run, eating snakes, and trying to find food, but that this was what he had to deal with as it's the price I have to pay. She suffered more pain. I took Lindsay's life. That fact does not change. According to these kind of excerpts, do you think he is guilty because he doesn't want to get caught? Or is he really guilty for what he has done? In order to not get caught, he also says that he always wore hats and a white mask to cover himself. But at the same time, you know in Asia, wearing masks is very usual. He was also able to go into malls and shops where a lot of people were, but he says that he never made eye contact. By this time, Lindsay's family were so desperate that there was a suspect on the loose, a killer on the loose. So police decided to offer a $121,000 reward anyone leading to his arrest. It was one day when he walked by the police station where there's usually a wanted sign of all the criminals and he saw his own face. So this is when first he decided to do a little bit of plastic surgery on himself. He got a box cutter and started to take out two moles on his face by himself, like he dug it up. Then using a scissor, he decided to cut the lower lip in order to make his lips thinner. He also tried using a thread and needles to make his nose narrower to give himself a nose job. He knew that this wasn't enough to deceive the police or the public that could recognize him and he decided to get some professional work done but in order to do that he needed some money. He started working at construction sites in various towns, never staying too long and hopping around different sites in order to prevent any detection. Within the time that he was on the run, he was able to gather about $12,000 where police say most of the money went into plastic surgery. He ended up having two operations on his nose where first he made it narrower, second to raise the bridge of the nose. There's also a rumor that he had double eyelid surgery and had cheek implants. Now the thing is when you get plastic surgery done, I've been to plastic surgery clinics as well and they always take before and after pictures so that you could compare and also it helps out the staff and the surgeon. Pasilla agreed to take the photos because I guess he didn't really have any other options and this is when the surgeon and the clinic staff got really suspicious. They noticed that the mole in his face was like cut off by himself and they started to recognize, hmm, this guy's face kind of looks similar. So the clinic actually handed over his photos before and after photos to the police and bam, this is when the police put his new plastic surgery face on TV and the newspaper. And as you guys can see, his face seems very swollen, like, like the bottom part of the lips is definitely changed. Like his own personal scissor cutting of the lips definitely Definitely worked and I think because he did it in a very improper way, his bottom lips, his chin seems very swollen. Tatsuya claims that he once was watching TV and he saw his own face. He claims that his heart was racing so fast and that he gazed at the picture of himself trembling. In order to conceal himself again, he got a haircut, bought a fake beard, sideburns, and a mustache. On November 10th, 2009, two years and six months on the run, Tatsuya was trying to flee by boarding a ferry to Okinawa. Police got a tip of where he was and finally Tatsuya was arrested. Later on in the interrogation, he claimed that he didn't mean to kill Lindsay. He was only trying to silence her for a moment when he accidentally killed her. Now, I personally believe that he was just saying this in order to lessen the sentence because the sentencing differs whether you premeditated or you didn't. Tatsuya also claimed that he tried to revive her after but it didn't work. She was already gone. Eventually, Tatsuya was sentenced to life in prison. The odd thing about his diaries is that he never actually mentioned the killing of Lindsay nor the motive of what he has done. But at the same time, he also writes an apology and like a remorse by saying, how could I have done such a stupid thing? I'm not really sure the psychology but why do you think that he wrote all the emotions of what happened after and how he was feeling but not go into detail of what actually happens? Was what he had done only left in his dark, deep memories and he 
didn't want to talk about it. Another creepy thing is the day that Lindsay died that morning, actually Tatsuya and his girlfriend were together in his apartment, but they were fighting, bickering, and the girlfriend ended up leaving the apartment because she was angry at whatever argument they were having about. But she decided that she wanted to make it up with Tatsuya and she came back to his apartment when she saw police and caution tape all over. What do you think his then girlfriend was going through? The fact that your boyfriend just murdered someone and it could have been you possibly. He later published his writings into a book and claimed that he will donate all the royalties to Lindsay's family. And of course, Lindsay's family denied. There's also a movie that was made after the book where it predominantly focuses on Tatsuya and his emotions and his diary and what he was going through in the two and a half years he was on the run. And Lindsay's family claimed that it's a disrespect to Lindsay. I mean, technically you're kind of not glamorizing, but you made this horrible killer the main character. Although the movie director was claimed that it was to better know a criminal's mind and their emotions. If there's any other cases you guys want me to talk about, remember to email askcrazy at gmail.com. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to check HelloFresh out and see you guys in my next video. There's a movie out on Netflix called Silenced. Silenced is based on a true event called the Inhua School incident that took place in South Korea. Inhua School incident has been one of Korea's biggest scandals involving a long history of disabled students being abused by the teachers and principals and the outcome of the legal battle will shock you. We're going to talk about the details and if you're going to be watching the movie or this video, I'm going to give you a TW trigger warning obviously even the movie was very hard to watch i honestly thought that a lot of the scenes was just fantasy obviously for the movie for the shock factor but when i researched the real story they actually made the movie lighter and what happened in real life was even a lot worse than that so in June 2005, a broadcasting channel, NBC PD documentary, was contacted by a school teacher claiming that they had a big story they wanted to share with the media because the police would not do anything about it. When you don't have power to yourself, what better than media? So there used to be a school called Inhua in Gwangju province. The school was catered to mostly deaf students and I believe other intellectual disabilities. It first opened in 19. 50s and had since received continuous monetary government support. But the corruption of the school did not start in the 2000s, it started way back. With allegations of forcing hard labor on students to work around the school, increasing the amount of students attending the school, so above the maximum capacity in order to receive more monetary funds from the government, reselling the donated goods that was for the school and for the students. Now, if you see the movie Silence, which actually came out in 2011, you'll see that it is starred by Kong Yu. In the movie, he is basically forced to donate about $50,000 to the school in order to teach. And this was in real life, where the higher teachers actually had to do forced donation, where you give the school thousands of dollars in order to teach there. From what I've gathered, being a teacher is a highly prized and praised position in Korea. Sometimes it is hard to get a job. You really need like referrals and things like that, especially schools. You know, you need to have other schools referring you and giving you a good word so you could be hired in other places. So again, in June of 2005, a teacher by the name Chun, we're going to call him Jay for the video, decided to come forward as he got some information that his students were being sexually abused and are by some teachers. Now, teacher Jay had disability himself. Now, in this school, it's interesting. It's for the disability, like deaf and mute kids, but a lot of the head staff members in the school didn't even know sign language. So it was only like specific number of teachers that knew sign language. So Mr. Jay having disability himself was able to really relate to the students more than others. He got a call from a parent of a student who claimed, my daughter's friend said she was S-8ed by the head admin. So Mr. Jay being shocked, obviously, that this was going on, he decided to take it to some other teachers in the school. He claims that he first took it to the female nurse, obviously. Now the school nurse, when Jay told him this, she seemed kind of not really surprised. She just said okay and he heard nothing from her after that. He went to some other teachers about it to see what they should do. And again, same response, like okay, we'll deal with it and then nothing. Now funny enough, when he asked the student, the female students, like why did you tell me? Because you know, I'm a male teacher as well, like how, why would you believe me? And the female student said, well she did try to tell other teachers and they literally told her to 
forget about it. Now, I do want to emphasize that a lot of the students that attended this Inhua school were orphans. Some students had parents who also were disabled. Some were living with their grandparents. Some only had one parent. So a lot of these students came from a not so well background. It was also known that the school had a dormitory. Again, a lot of students were orphaned or they would live far away. And this is like the only disability disabled school that they would have in this town or province. So a lot of these young students will live in the dormitories. Now, because nobody in the school was listening, teacher Jay decided to take this case to a different facility outside of the school that takes care of like the disabled community. They would go on to pull these students and interview them. And what they found out was shocking. So starting from this girl, she would say that since elementary school, she would not only be SA slash R by the head admin, but from the principals and other teachers and staff members for years. Of course, this was just not her. There were multiple students now coming forward from age 7 to 22, especially the adults now were young when this happened. And here's some of the details of what the students claim has happened to them. So at first, some of these male teachers will touch the students behind tapping them in the behind time to time and they will call him a pervert you know that pervert teacher and it started from there so some of these students will be pulled over by the head admin the principal some of the higher staff members into their room and be shown adult videos corn some students would catch the head admin watching adult videos while self pleasing himself. Physical assaults didn't matter boys or girls, especially towards those kids who lived in the dormitory. So a lot of these would happen at night when these kids would live here. A witness says that in woodworking class, a teacher made everyone watch a movie and in a corner or somewhere in the class where kids couldn't really see, he would bring a chair over there into that blind spot, pull over a female student and start to S A her. One student noticed this and told the teacher to stop, but the teacher would threaten the witness if they would tell anyone, he would kill them. Another claimed that they would be called to the staff's room, telling her that she would be given snacks, but then she would be S A and art in that room. And here's like an image of where these things were happening in these staff members' rooms. A student who had her hands and feet bounded in the staff room from night till the morning, S.A. and r for 15 hours. There were students who would accidentally witness these things because they would hear like kids screaming and crying. But these witnesses would be taken to the head admin's room and physically assaulted with a soda, glass bottle, and a bat. Students who received a low grade on a test, instead of receiving the normal punishment, the teacher would make them give him a kiss or S.A. them as a low grade punishment. Spoiler alert, the scene in the movie where the kid is getting her head dunk in the laundry machine while it was on. A form of water torture slash cruel punishment was actually going on in real life for telling on other teachers of what was happening to her, like being S.A. and R. And other teachers would punish the students for telling the truth. Another incident where the head admin would invite a student over to his house where his family lived, would feed them and treat them nicely. And the next day when the family would go out to work or whatever, the admin would be left alone with this kid and would SA slash R her in his own house where he stayed with his wife and kids. This would also happen in field trips, in rooms where they were sleeping in. They would try to force themselves on them while they were sleeping. Another student says that she was trying to clean in school. In Korea, it is also a duty of the student to clean the classrooms and the teacher would follow them, asking them to do adult stuff with him. Now here's a video of a student trying to explain what happened to her. She says that she would be pulled over to these rooms. All of a sudden, the teacher would lock the door, hug her from behind and try to push themselves on her. As you could see, she is deaf and she cannot express herself. She is using sign languages and apparently there isn't all the words that we speak vocally that can be translated to sign languages. So a lot of these times they could not even express themselves properly. And not only that, when they're deaf and mute, it was hard for them to even scream and get help that they needed. 
the only things that these students could do is try to express themselves with sign language or try to show with like hand movements that they didn't want these things to happen to them. But as you could see, because of their disability, it was so hard for them to get any help or to tell anyone properly, or it just took them years to open this up to someone. So remember, some of these teachers literally paid to work. They also felt like a duty to not say anything because they already got this position and you know they didn't want to be fired. And it got so bad that even like a school bus driver heard about this. And when he was about to talk about it to some other teachers, they actually tried to threaten him and beat him up as well, the school bus driver, for talking about it. And the more that these students try to do something about it, it made it even worse for them. Now here's a twist in this case and why this was able to work out for such a long time. The powerful people who ran the school were all related. So for example, the chairman of Inhua School was the father. His wife was also the chairman. The principal was the first son of the chairman. The head admin, who pretty much did the worst of all, was the second son. The head of the students were also a relative and so on and so forth. So all these higher positions in the school were all relatives and related, like how disgusting. So that's how they made it possible to cover these things up so easily. And I just think it's so disgusting how the whole freaking family and relatives are into this. It's not just one person sick in the head in the family, it's literally the whole entire generation. Now think about it, you are a student who have no parents, or maybe you have a disabled parent. You literally live in the school. You wake up in the school, you study in the school, and you gotta go home in the school. All of the head teachers are involved in this. All the teachers that you spoke to will not do anything and tell you to forgive them or forget about it. Literally, it is hell here. So when the media got involved, that's when finally the nation started to find out about this case and police decided to really step up and do something about it. But before that happened, it took a lot of people to protest against the school for this to happen. Now there were some teachers who were obviously not involved in all of this who were also protesting. Now those teachers who decided to seek help and talk against the school were fired. It's a big taboo to be fired as a teacher. You, you might never get a job, never get recommended. Um, including teacher Jay, he was also fired. So finally, after the first round of investigation, they found up to six suspects, including the principal, especially head admin, and found nine victims who decided to come forward. Now, obviously, they believe that the number of the victims are way higher, but it is so hard to get some people to confess and really come to the trials and everything. That's even scary in itself. I mean, you need witnesses, you need proof, you need a lot of things backing up. And I've personally not been through criminal, but like been through just regular legal stuff. And that's a lot of work and a lot of balls to really come forward and tell your truth. It's scary to speak up against the suspects. It is really scary. That's why a lot of people just decide to stay quiet. Not to mention, if you don't even have parents and you're literally, you've been living in this school, how do you even come forward? Who do you go to? Knowing that you probably don't ever wanna face these people again. So here's the outcome of the trial, but remember this happened in the 2000s, so the law was a bit different back then. So the principal who SA slash R the kids received two years and six months in prison. The head admin of the school, who was known to do actually the worst of all, all these people, received only eight months in prison. Another teacher who received only 10 months in prisons. Other perpetrators and people involved to cover up like the wife of the principal and other female leaders like the nurses were never punished. Even on top of that, a slap in the face, in the appeal trial, most of these victims claimed that the punishment was too severe and they actually got released. Most of them got released on probation. So here is why. Although in 2005 to 2010, it's not that long ago, it's what, literally 12 to 15 years ago only, the law was different. So in in South Korea back then, apparently SA, sexual assault, was considered a independent accusation rather than a federal crime. So in order for the police to investigate, the victims had to physically sue the suspects instead of just like the police or the government handling it on their own. Of course, in these days, in today's world, only 10, 15 years later, you know, it's a federal crime, yes. On top of that, back then, sexual crimes could have been mediated between the two parties. So let's say the suspect decide to mediate with the victim's family. Usually it's the family because, you know, the students were minors. 
they would offer them a monetary exchange to forgive them. Just receive a couple thousand bucks or a hundred bucks, who knows how much. Bam, no punishments because it's technically independent accusations rather than a federal crime. Also, the law that I actually did not understand and why this was put into place in the first place was that there used to be a statute of limitation when it came to these accusations. So the sexual assault accusation was only one year from knowing the suspect. So after one year, you can't even sue them, which is the stupidest thing because when it comes to these S, A, and R accusations, it is so hard to speak up. It takes people years if they even ever speak up. So to put a limit into something like this just doesn't make sense. Now remember, these horrific crimes in Inhua school was going on since 2000. So by the time this news was out there, it was like six years had already passed. So technically, they try to claim that statute of limitation, like five, six years passed, so you can't punish me. Now one of the most interesting when it came to the judgments of this particular case, there's apparently a regular R rape and a felony rape. Now, in order to distinguish this, of course, felony is even a heavier charge. The judges had to decide if in felony, did this victim have no ability to consent slash defend themselves or have any conscious awareness of what was happening to them. So prosecutors obviously pushed for felony charges, but the judges ruled that because the students, even though they had a disability, were able to try and fight off or reject the suspects with a hand gesture or whatever kind of gesture with their body, which indicated that they were conscious enough and they were self-aware of the situation, so it was not considered a felony, which was obviously like, what, 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 WTF? Also, actually, some of the students' family did settle with the suspects, which is also the reason why they got such a low punishment in jail time. The suspects' families actually paid off the victims in order to drop their charges. So in the end, there was not even enough victims. Today, these victims are mostly adults now. A victim says that she will never have any male companions she has no interest in male celebrities she would never want to date in the future because of this another student who said that psychologically they've have been absolutely messed up so in 2011 in south korea the movie togani or silenced was released togani in korean actually means a very very hot plate or a bowl that could even melt steel which could represent the anger and frustration of those who are affected so after the nation was outraged after watching this movie, so in 2011, a new investigation was opened and they were able to put the head admin, the person who was accused of SA and R students from night till morning, he received eight years in prison compared to the eight months from the last trial. So they were able to gather new evidences to prosecute this guy and they did. Now again, because of the movement, there was a new law place called the Togani Law, which indicated that the disabled and those under the age of 13 would no longer have any statute of limitation when it came to SA slash R, and also a greater sentence and punishment time for the suspects. So that is a real story of the movie Silence. I do highly recommend if you are obviously over 18 and allowed to watch Netflix, I recommend watching this movie and seeing in vision in moving pictures of what really went on. It's just so different when you're seeing it versus just reading articles. You'll notice a lot of the scenes where I literally thought there's no way this could have been real, but they actually made these scenes even lighter than what happened in real life. So that's even also crazy. Remember to hit the like button and share this video so that we can spread the messages and tell these stories so that we can protect our future kids and those who are in a vulnerable place. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to check out today's partner, All Night Psychic Keen. See you in my next video. Today's case is named one of the biggest unsolved mysteries from Japan. The interesting thing is, the suspect left so much clues and evidence, but still, even 20 years later, the suspect has never been found. Most people in Japan actually believe that the suspect is a Korean male. 
Could that theory be right or wrong? We will get into it. And the suspect is still out there. And I believe that my American audience, especially, we can help solve the criminal because I personally believe that this could have been an American suspect. Now, a lot of YouTubers have talked about this case, and I'm sure you might have heard of it, the Setagaya family story. But recently, a Korean documentary have done a deep dive into this, and they have gone through a lot of gossips, rumors about this case, and they were able to prove that some of them are just big speculation. So what is the truth? What is the fall? What have I found? And why do I think that a suspect could be American? There might be some new information and take in my video, so stay tuned. It was December 30th, the year of 2000, two days shy from New Year's. Everybody was getting excited. I mean, it was just Christmas. Now it's going to be a new year. Everybody is in the festive mode at the time of the year. There's a providence in Japan, Goseta Gaia. So Seta Gaia is not the family's name. This is a province in Japan. And in one of a quiet, nice looking neighborhood, the family named the Miyazawa family lived in this three story house again in a pretty nice neighborhood. The youngest son was six years old, Ray. The mother, the wife, was named Yazuko. They also had a daughter, eight years old. And the father named Miko, he was working at a British marketing firm at the time. And this house is interesting because it was kind of split into half. I believe it was Miko's mother and father. So this was a full house, you guys, but I believe this was more like a secluded area. You guys know a lot of places in Asia are like cities, but living in this huge house, apparently there was a park that was also adjacent to their house. So they also lived a pretty luxurious, I would say pretty luxurious life in Japan. Now the next day on December 31st, around 10 to 10.30 a.m., the relatives that lived right next door called Miyazawa's family and nobody would be picking up. Now usually this is a time where at least the parents would be awake. I mean, it is pretty much New Year's Eve. The phone line was dead, meaning it sounded like someone has literally pulled the plugs to the phone. So the parents who live right next door decided to ring the doorbell, nobody opened, they went inside, and that's when they discovered something that they will never be able to unfortunately get out of their head, which was their entire family, the entire Miyazawa family murdered. And there were pools of blood everywhere, which meant that again, you know, the bodies have been there for a couple hours. Looking at the crime scene, here are the details of what the police believe happened. Of course, we never know the exact timeline, but they were able to figure some things out. So it was most likely that the suspect entered their house through the second floor bathroom by hopping over the fence and climbing over through their bathroom window, which was open. But the suspect did have to remove the window screen. So they broke into the house House, and because this was the second floor, that is where their youngest son, Ray, was sleeping in. And that's why he could have been most likely the first suspect. So the suspect went to the little boy's room and took his life by choking. Now, this is when we presume that because of all the noise, the father, Mika, who was on the first floor, most likely using his computer, rushed upstairs to see what was going on, what is all this noise, and came face to face with the suspect. The father, Mika, was stabbed multiple times, including his his head. Actually, they found parts of the weapon inside of his head. And there were many evidence that they got into a wrestle. So the father was trying to, you know, do everything he can to protect his family, but unfortunately it was not successful and he ended up passing away. So as they were wrestling, police did find evidence of the suspect's blood as well. So during the wrestle, police can see that the suspect was also cut or stabbed a couple of times, leading to a pretty good amount of blood that they were able to gather. The weapon, the knife that was used, also also snapped in half. So you could tell what kind of immense force that the suspect had to use to end these innocent lives. After the stabbing, most likely Miko has lost consciousness and fell down the stairs to the first floor. Floor. Because his sashimi knife actually broke that he brought with him, he looked through their kitchen to find a new weapon. Getting the weapon from their own kitchen, he went upstairs to the third floor, again stabbing both the mother and the daughter. And they also have evidence from the mother's autopsy that she had a lot of defense wounds and she was trying the best to protect herself and of course her family. And during this whole thing, they believe that Yazuko trying to protect the daughter while trying to protect her, they both lost consciousness and fell down from the third floor to the second floor, rolling down the stairs. Evidence of heavy, heavy force was used against them. So the suspect had one plan when he came into this house.
house. It was to literally end their lives, not to just steal, not to just, you know, scare them. It was to literally end the entire family's life. Now, police say that they can tell they've been there for a while because it was just a pool of blood and that it had almost been like now starting to dry up. And it was just one of the worst scenes that some of investigators has ever witnessed. So based on just this evidence alone, you could see like who this suspect had a lot of resentment, a lot of anger. I mean, was it revenge? I mean, was he just crazy? What was it? Let's try to find out. So the thing that makes this case just so media frenzy and un comprehensible is the fact that the suspect left pretty much every single clue that you would want investigators to know because I will get to the list but he literally left everything there the fact that he still isn't caught is is mind-blowing so first of all the suspect left all his clothing, literally left behind his whole outfit from his plaid scarf because it was pretty cold at the time it was December his black gloves his shoes both of his shoes his jacket, a bag, a baseball shirt that was found to have only sold 130 pieces of them in Japan, which was also covered in blood. And of course, he left the knife weapon as well. There were also two handkerchiefs that belonged to the suspect, and one of them was used to wrap around the kitchen knife to prevent the knife from slipping. So another clue, he was very prepared and he knew what he was doing. I'm wondering, then what did the suspect wear out when he was leaving? I mean, did he go out naked? I'm pretty sure not. Did he bring like a second backpack with like his clothes in it? Like a pair to change and he just brought that backpack and clothes with him? Or did he wear the suspect's clothing? Maybe went downstairs, wear the clothing of the fathers and left. Now that part is not specified. I'm sure if he wore the suspect's clothing, there would be blood evidence, which there is evidence of him going through the entire house and leaving it a mess. Unless it was your clothing, I mean, how would police or relatives know if the suspect took like one shirt. Now the type of clothing that they found that belonged to the suspect, the style of it, you could see it is pretty much a style for like at least a teenager or someone in their 20s. I wouldn't even say 30s, especially back in the 2000s. Maybe in this day and age, this clothes would pass for someone in their 30s, but back in 2000, I believe this definitely had to belong to someone in their teens and 20s. Of course, we never know or for sure it could have been a decoy. And here's where things get interesting and this is a little bit of my theory as well. So in this little fanny pack that they found that belonged to the suspect, in the forensic testing, they found some residue of power that came from a printing processing plant. There were some sources that also say that they found sand in the bag, little pieces of sand that was traced to the Nevada desert, more precisely the area of Edward Air Force Base in California. Remember this detail, we'll get into it in just a bit. The suspect was also a blood type A and DNA testing showed something really interesting. It showed that the man most likely was a mixed race including a mother of European descent and father to be East Asian. Although they also say they can't tell if the mother would be full European or like it is also the mother's ancestors that were European, that's kind of unsure. Also the East Asian descent from his father shows that quote, analysis of the Y chromosome shows the haplogroup OM122, a common haplogroup distributed in East Asian people, appearing in one in four or five Koreans, one in 10 Chinese and one in 13 Japanese. Another reason why a lot of Japanese people still believe that the suspect is Korean. Investigators believe that his clothing and his knife could have been purchased in the Kanagawa prefecture. So there is a possibility that the killer, Japanese or not, foreigner or not, did purchase these items, his clothing and knife in Japan. But I looked up if there's any US military bases in Japan and there is. So it says that the Yokata Air Base is the main base of US military troops in Japan. And I took a look at the map. It is only an hour away from where they believe that the suspect purchased the items. Now here is where the Setagaya province and the neighborhood of where this happened was. And it is about a little over an hour drive from the base. Going back to the DNA test, it says that this person was most likely a mixed race. Now, could it be that the suspect could have been the son of a military base officer or he himself being in the military? There was also an interesting thing that I want to add to this. In the Korean documentary where they went into this case, there was a Japanese retired, I don't remember if he was a police officer or if he was like a media spokesperson for crime 
cases, but he was going around different stations and media claiming that he still believes that the suspect is Korean because he says that Korean men go to the military mandatory military service for two years. Japanese people do not. Based on how the suspect was able to use pretty much a skilled way to end people's life and so prepared, he believes that the person had to be someone with military training. Someone that knew how to wield a knife, which is very true because a normal person will be very clumsy with using a knife, but this person seemed pretty comfortable. So maybe the suspect wasn't a Korean citizen, but a part Korean blood mixed race person that could have been someone stationed in the u.s military base in japan and there were actually many cases that i've heard about and read about and presented on my channel where a lot of foreign military personnel especially the u.s military who are stationed in a different country commits a crime almost a lot of the times they're protected by the u.s military and this is because they do not want to cause any media frenzy they don't want to cause any uproar by that country in this case japan and knowing that especially Asian cultures, you know, if, if something happens by a foreigner, they get really angry. There's a whole protest. U.S. military and the bases get a very bad rep. Hence, one of the reasons why a lot of them are protected, even if they do these heinous crimes. So could it be that at this base, maybe they know who could have been a suspect. And because they're not Japanese citizen or a Korean citizen, they were able to go back to the U.S. or a different country and never be caught. I'm gonna get a little bit more into this, but let's go back to the crime scene. So after the murder, there's evidence that the suspect hung around, literally thinking that it was his house, and had just a bizarre behavior. So after all of this, the suspect literally chilled at the house, eating ice cream from their fridge. And it wasn't him like getting a spoon and eating it. There's evidence that he literally just grabbed it by the hand and literally kind of like ate it with his teeth, almost like kind of savage, like he was super hungry or something. He also drank four bottles of tea inside the fridge and some fruits as well. To me, this shows bizarre behavior. The fact that you're just eating ice cream out of the tub with your teeth when it's probably like frozen, hard frozen, it shows his mental mind. It was just like crazy. And chugging down four bottles of tea, I mean, I could just imagine how he was doing that. The suspect even used a toilet without flushing, went number two. And yes, they actually got the samples of his feces and it showed that a couple days before he ate some bean sprouts or string beans and sesame seeds, which I'm not sure if that will really help because a lot of Asian people eat that. Evidence that he went through the house and just ransacked it, especially using their band-aid and their first aid kits, most likely to try and cover up his cuts from the fight and wrestle. A lot of their drawers were opened. I mean, papers flying everywhere. Apparently there was like papers that he dumped into their bathtub. There was also evidence that he took some of the money that Miko had stored in their house and some money that was left behind. So, so people say, I mean, I don't think he even took that much money and left some money behind. So, so the motive is a little shaky when it comes to money, if that was their sole reason. Now there's some people who say that there's evidence of him taking a nap on the couch. I'm not sure how you're gonna prove that someone actually napped there or just sat there for a couple minutes. So basically the suspect after murdering four people just chilled, ate, went to the bathroom, maybe took a nap. So the behavior of this suspect is bizarre. He wasn't even thinking like, oh my God, I'm gonna get caught. Oh my God, I have to clean up the scene. Like he just went bizarre, almost like a monster. So whoever this was has a super chaotic mindset, super pretty much psychopathic mental state he was in. Another crazy evidence was the computer being used. So this was Hamiko's or the family's computer on the first floor. The forensic showed that at 1.18 and 10.05 a.m. in the morning, someone was using the computer. That means pretty much 10 hours that the suspect was hanging around. But unfortunately, the 10.05 one is a little shaky because they believe that Yasuko's mother, the relative who came inside of the house, could have touched the computer, you know, while she was kind of looking through the house, panicking, oh my God, what's going on? So the 10.05 could have been Yasuko's mother, although she claimed that she came in around 10.30 to 10.40. Again, part of the reason why sometimes you do have to get the exact time and separate the evidence and the witness statements. I mean, these kind of crime investigations have to be done in a particular way. 
and they do believe the police did not do a great job in the beginning of collecting these witness statements and evidence. So a lot of these things might not be too reliable. But I personally thought if you're in a crazy state and you go into the house and you see your family murdered. I don't know if the first thing I will be is to go to the computer and like shake the mouse. Also, I'm not sure if this computer evidence is like them using the internet or them just like turning on the computer or like moving the mouse also records what time that it does that. So that's also unclear exactly what time in the computer evidence they're talking about. It could be both. I mean, if the suspect did stick around till 10 a.m. in the morning, that is very, very risky. And I think someone could have seen the suspect. It's especially being clumsy like this, they could have seen someone with like bloody shoes and bloody hands. So the suspect's shoe that was found at their house, the shoe size was 280 millimeters or a foot size of 11 in American conversion. Now they found that the sneaker was made specifically in a Korean factory and the shoe size was never sold in Japan, meaning most likely this person came from a foreign country, Korea or somewhere else. I guess back then in Japan, the, the feet sizes were were pretty small, so they didn't sell anything like above a certain size. Although it was found that the suspect with all the clothings put together was around 170 centimeters, which is only five foot six. Would a five foot six man have a shoe size 11? Is that a thing? You guys let me know. From what I know, your foot size does correlate to your height size. I mean, a five foot six man having that big of a feet. Was it a decoy shoe that this person actually had big feet? It, this man was also pretty slender and they trimmed down the age to 15 to 35 years old and he was also right-handed. The police also believe that the suspect could be Korean so they even put flyers of looking for the suspect not only in Japanese but in Korean language as well in case that anyone knew about this. Now this is a sketch, alleged sketch of what the suspect could have looked like. And it was drawn I believe in 2002 and it was spread all over the Japanese media. Apparently in the description of the sketch it says quote, a face that cannot be Japanese man but Korean features. As being a Korean, this face could go in any race, to be honest. But we later find out this sketch was not from a witness. This sketch was done by a psychic who claimed that he can see what the suspect look like. So it was not from the police, it was not from the prosecutors, not from the witness. This was just a psychic drawing. So I don't think this was really that reliable. I mean, it could be. The suspect could look like that, but... And could that have hindered the investigation? I do think so a little bit. Now, how about fingerprints? I mean, there was fingerprints everywhere left with this guy, and yes, they did find some. Unfortunately, though, in Japan, only high-profile criminals' fingerprints are stored in the database. They did take a look at the Japanese database and did not find anyone with a fingerprint, and apparently, in today's technology, even with a little bit, you don't even need the whole fingerprint, just a little portion of it leads you to the person. The Japanese also requested the Korean government if they can look up this fingerprint in Korean database because in Korea, all citizens, at least with the ID card, must register their fingerprints. I'm not sure where this all, everyone has to get it and put it in the database started. It could have been in the 90s, it could have been the 2000s, maybe it was before or after this murder happened. They did look up into the entire database of Korean citizens or anyone that had their fingerprints on there. If you want to go to the hospital, if you want to you know, do anything in Korea, you need this. And they found zero match, meaning maybe the suspect wasn't Korean. Maybe they had the blood of a Korean, but wasn't actually a Korean citizen. At least in today, foreigners also must register their fingerprints. I'm not sure if that was the case in the 90s or 2000s, but that also kind of leads to my theory that it could have been in a different citizen, maybe a US military, a US citizen. Now these fingerprint database is being uploaded constantly and any fingerprints that they try to find with any criminals, again, that's constantly being updated and still to the say 2023, zero matches, at least in South Korea. There could be other theories if this person was a Korean citizen. Um, they could have just never got their ID cards, never like been to any legal places, just been hiding for the last 20 something years. But it also means that at least in these two countries, this person has never committed a crime 
and put into jail. Now here's a book in Japan that was published back then. And pretty much what this book say is, I know who did it. The author of the book says that they know for sure who did it and they got this information from a Korean mafia. They even named the person of the suspect and apparently this Japanese author says the suspect is a man named Lee In In, a Korean man. That this person did work at a printing facility. Um, I think they went into details about some other stuff, but basically claiming that they were sure that this was a suspect and it just matched every description of what the police found. But the problem is this author wrote many crime books claiming that they knew who the suspect was whenever these big crime cases would happen. And it became pretty popular. A lot of people read it. A lot of people kind of fed into this non-factual, non-actual evidence kind of fantasy book. And people do not see the credibility into this. Uh, they just believe that these authors are using these to make pretty much fame and money because people will buy it. It is like, oh my God, they do know who did it. But unfortunately, they cannot find anywhere that this person Yi In Eun is existing and is a real person beyond this book. And Yi In Eun is a pretty uncommon name. At least I've never heard of it. So again, books like this did fuel into the idea that, oh my God, the suspect was Korean, but it could not be. It could be all wrong. This case apparently had over 246,000 investigators that worked on this case for over 20 years and about 12,545 pieces of evidence that they still have in their database waiting for the suspect. Now, my question is, if this was such a huge, ending the lives of four people is a big thing. So did the family, the relatives not hear anything? And I'm sure they were sleeping in the next house. So to not hear anything is, is interesting. I mean, it could be that because it is a pretty big house. It is a separated house. Maybe they weren't able to hear much if they were just sleeping in a deep sleep. It is possible no one heard anything, especially it's not a city city. This is like a secluded house. It is unfortunate that there there is no witnesses at all. The ultimate reason why people do think that unfortunately Japanese police did fail in finding the suspect was because of the way they went about the investigation. They might have thought that the case would be easily solved. They might have mixed in the wrong evidence and witness statements and kind of like mixed all that up. Mixed with sometimes the media frenzy feeding into the fact that maybe they were looking for the wrong type of suspect. Some of the evidence was contaminated in that way that could have led to a failure of finding the real suspect. Especially if it's a foreign citizen they've left, I mean, it's going to be almost impossible to find them. Now I say the biggest thing that I think they can do is going on those ancestry DNA sites, especially in the US, if they believe that it could have been a foreigner or maybe in Europe, I don't know, maybe a different country that do things like this. But I say US again for my theory reasons there, especially if his mother is a European descendant, they could find people through their like third cousin, fourth cousins and like relatives and like track down the people. There might be a chance. And that's why I'm saying a lot of my US audiences could potentially help solve this. Again, I'm not saying that that is entirely true at all. Like I could be totally wrong, but it could have also been stationed in Korea and moved to Japan, like restationed. But at the end of the day, what was the motive? What was the motive for this person doing this? Was it a murder for hire that this person just randomly choose this person, the family? Did they have any relation to the family? Maybe Miko did know someone in that base. Maybe he knew someone that wanted money from him. Like, he seemed pretty well off in his family. Maybe he did something to piss someone off. I mean, we don't know that info much. But good things did come from this case, which was that in Japan, there was also a statute of limitation, especially crimes where the suspect can be sentenced to death. So very high, dark crimes, they did get rid of the statute of limitation because of this case, which I've talked about in the past, especially places like Korea also used to have statute of limitations. So sometimes you might find the suspect and never be able to prosecute them. Like my last case with the Hwasong case, that guy can never be prosecuted even though he unalived literally 15, 16, 70 people, something like that. The relatives of Miyazawa family are still today pleading with the public to help find who did this. And the grandfather of the kids or Miko's father, he also pleaded with the 
public to please help find the suspect and unfortunately he passed away before this case has been solved. The house was also recently shown to the media and the investigators and it's still standing. It's where this family had such beautiful time together, a beautiful big house and also where they had a tragic ending. So what do you guys think happened? I think that is just my theory, the best theory that I can come up with that it could have been someone in the military again with the way he wielded the knife could have gone back to the base could have gone back where and maybe some people do know who did this and don't want to come up and say it i believe that this case can be solved with so many evidence out there we just need to do a little bit of a dna test and a little bit of more searching to do in other countries outside of korea and japan because i don't believe the suspect is there leave your comments and thoughts below thank you so much for watching and see you on my next video